So good evening. I'm so glad to see so many people came up and touched the books. If you didn't get a chance to touch the books, please do so afterwards. I encourage everybody to go through them and take a look at them, open them. The only thing I ask is don't lick them. <laughs> and don't dribble water on them, because I'm pretty sure a couple of them will just disintegrate right there, and I might cry. Some of the things I'm going to talk about today are really about the literary annuals that are here in front of us. I wanted to give you an exhibit of that, but they're also about the American literary annuals that go over to the side here. Not necessarily about California in general, but what I want to do is really orient everybody about the historical moment of the literary annual, as well as what the British and the Americans were doing together in a transatlantic maybe partnership. The Americans were stealing stuff. Let's just, I'm just going to put that out there to, to begin with. Most of this is uh, based on the work that I did for, for my original book, Forget Me Not, The Rise of the British Literary Annual from 1823 to 1835. And that may sound like a typically academic book that only deals with 10 years, but I assure you I start with the 15th century emblem and then I move up all the way to the modernist period in the 1920s. In the book, not today. We'd be here for a very long time if we did that. But if you're interested in other things and you can go and check out the book. Most libraries have it. You don't have to buy it or do anything like that. But I'm, I'm, um, let me just say that my publisher would like me to say buy it, but I say go to a library. So I want to start off by thanking the Book Club of California for accepting my proposal to give a talk and a pop-up exhibit of these little gems that are right here. And somebody came up earlier and said they're not pop-up books, and so I just used the, uh, the verbiage of pop-up restaurants. So it's a pop-up exhibit that will go home with me um, so they don't get to stay here. Special thanks to Shruti for all of your help. We really appreciate it uh, and putting everything together tonight. And I, I hope everybody has a chance afterwards to go and look at the books a little bit more after I've given you a little more information about them. I realized after assembling the talk that I don't have many images of American literary annuals uh, because that portion of my research is still ongoing right now. It's the next book. So I brought you the actual books to meander through this evening. Now the slide that you see up here is my collection, a, just a piece of my collection. So you see I've only brought maybe a third or an eighth of my collection in general. These are the ones I laid out for my graduate students at my home and said pick the ones that you would like to play with. So at some point I'm going to have to release um, these into the wild, into a library for other people to be able to study. But for now they're mine, mine, they're all mine. <laughs> Don't touch my books. I mean touch my books, but you know. So I began working on 19th century British literary annuals because I couldn't find any of them during my doctoral work in New York City about 10 years ago. Even, even the, the other uh, places, the research institutes all around New York City didn't really hold a complete set of them. I needed to review the real annual to see it, to hold it, to study the bindings, to take a look at the paper, to look at the art, to feel the actual silk aspect of the keepsake, to to fondle the paper books and the paper bindings of the first Forget-Me-Not in 1823. I examined some microfiche and microfilm, which is always inadequate when you want the real thing, and I started looking at amassing my own collection of literary annuals. And at the time, when I was a grad student, they were about $10 each, and I think I single-handedly drove up the price of them to about 50, and now the ones that I'm missing in my curated collection are around five to $600. And so I, you have me to thank for those kinds of things. After acquiring full runs of the most popular British literary annuals from 1823 to about 1860, it's the equivalent of a straight flush for academics, uh, book collectors, and antiquarian booksellers. I began assembling the peripheral tertiary influences on literary annuals uh, in the form of almanacs, conduct manuals, and emblems from Europe and England, which was really exciting. The resulting study came about because I was able to access this personal collection to make definitive but generalizations still about the history of British literary annuals. Now I've begun to take a cursory look uh, at the influence of British annuals and their American pals, which are at that end of the table. It was not on purpose, they're just at that end of the table. The results have been really fascinating, and some of which I include here as my preliminary research um, at, towards the conclusion of the last few pages here. But first, what is a literary annual, and why is it so special other than its beauty and profoundly misunderstood history? So before we go into the annual, uh, I'm aware that many of you probably already know the history of the mechanization of print in the 19th century. 
I see some heads shaking. No, so I'm just going to give you a really quick orientation uh, through these. So when we're talking about the mechanization of print, we're talking about turning things into easily printable books or pamphlets that more and more people could read. That inevitably increases uh, access to reading materials and helps with literacy rates, especially in the early 19th century. When we're going from an agrarian community to more city-based communities and working in factories. So this means that there is a high demand for print materials. Things like setting in a f uh, this particular compositor stick went the way of the dodo bird and eventually they figured out how not to have to set every individual letter itself. From 1810 to 1820 they were just doing what's called stereotyping. This is a particular form that you would set. This is a very small eight and a half by 11. It took me nine hours along with a friend who's in the audience to set that. Can you imagine somebody setting 300 pages of this text up here? Yes. <laughs> uh, this is a 19th century printing press. You can see that we have the form already inserted and the platen is up at the front where we'll be inking. And this one has been mechanized. It's, it's, uh, they've added a belt afterwards in the 20th century and so we were able to add power to it and run and print things off in about two hours after the seven hours of setting the type. We also have, this is what's called stereotyping. This is a newspaper at the particular time where they'd set all of the type and then they would, it would usually be steel and then they would put cardboard or what the equivalent of wet cardboard over it, create an impression and then they could also uh, create uh, a steel plate from that as well. So they didn't have to reset or hand set the type every time and they didn't have to redo it if, you know, Bob bumped into you and messed up a whole line and you weren't, didn't have to yell at him. Some of the things that happened in the 19th century with print culture is that it was overwhelming. You think you're overwhelmed right now with all of your screens. If you have more than three, then welcome to what they were feeling. At the same time that people were starting to see more and more materials out for sale, they were also wondering what else, what other information there was. And people became acclimated to seeing more and more information and they, they didn't know how to gain access to it because it was expensive. Paper was very expensive. So there's the ads in the newspapers, there's the monthly periodicals and magazines for all kinds of students and uh, all kinds of audiences. Then that's a 19th century newspaper that's one sheet in and of itself, disorganized, small. You'll have obituaries with reviews with newspaper stories uh, about what's going on in that particular moment. Uh, and then you also have political tracts. Dime novels, which were very short, but still you had to buy them and you had to figure out where to buy them and which was the best one to buy because you didn't have that much money to spend on print materials. Then there were all, all the single volume poetries uh, for by all the different, uh, I was going to say faculty, but that's not it, <laughs> by all of the different poets in the early 19th century in the Romantic period. Beautiful bindings, but you really couldn't afford it if you were working in a factory. Then we have the novel itself, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is also printed during this time in 1818 and then revised in 1831. So you have the novel coming to prominence at the same time and Sir Walter Scott as well. Uh, then we have medical journals, but you get the idea. So with that contextualization and orientation, what we're going to really talk about today is moving from 1820 to about 1860 with the literary annuals. And you see with all of this material, people had choices about what they were going to buy. The literary annual was incredibly popular, but it was also very expensive. So by no November 1822, the British reading public had already voraciously consumed both Walter Scott's expensive novels and Rudolph Ackerman's exquisite lithographs. The next de decade referred to by some scholars as dormant and unproductive because all of the male poets had died by that time is in fact bursting with forget-me-nots, friendships, offerings, keepsakes, and literary souvenirs. Queen Victoria will take over the throne in the 1830s, and so we have a whole new generation of literature that's going to be produced in England at about that time. The literary annual with its poetry, short stories, dramatic scenes, sheet music, travel accounts, political statements, historical renderings, you name it, they had it, descriptions of Europe, war accounts, artwork, portraits, lavish bindings, and bevy of famous authors, they all introduced a literary and visual genre that would be both scorned and embraced by England and beyond. The annuals are early 19th century British texts published yearly in England from 1822 to 1860 and intended for a primarily middle class audience and therefore moderately priced 12 shillings to 3 pounds, which is a 
approximately $40 to $50 for us today, I believe. Initially published in duodecimo or octavo sizes, and I'm just going to point to these. So this would be duodecimo, small enough to fit in your hand. If you take a look at it, it's got gilt edges all the way around it. As the years went on, the annuals got bigger and bigger, but the type didn't actually get bigger, just the book itself. These volumes published in these very small diminutive sizes were uh, bound with, uh, they exuded a feminine delicacy that attracted a primarily female readership. The annuals were released each November, making them an ideal Christmas gift, lover's present, or token of friendship. Selling more than 100,000 copies during each holiday season, the annuals were accused of causing an epidemic and inspiring an unmasculine and unbody age that lingered in derivative forms until the early 20th century in both the United States and England. Originally published in paper boards, the annuals were usually whisked away to be rebound in beautiful leather covers, such as this one. And this one is actually on display up here, if you want to look later. By 1828, publishers employed the latest innovations in binding and switched to silk to amplify the value of the material object. Each annual typically offered a confined space for dedication. And there was somebody actually came out with a how to write an inscription. And one of them said, write it in pencil because you never know who you might love next and you can erase the inscription and give it to somebody else. Very lascivious of them. That's not very conduct manual, you know, ladies take it down a notch. That's more like yeah, multiple lovers. Early annuals, the 1823 to 1826, offered practical information similar to the stationer's company's almanac, but that would soon disappear in favor of more literary and visual content. Engravings were cast from popular paintings, but rarely garnered fame for the engraver, who was deemed a mere copyist and denied entrance into the Royal Academy. And if you see the difference between these two, the original oil painting by John Martin is one of the ones that was held in one, a local museum in London. And these things wouldn't necessarily travel around, so the way that everybody got to see artwork was by looking at engravings or artistic renderings. You'll notice the difference in Henry LeCue's en engraving, and he was quite famous as an engraver, is that he refocuses the, uh, the painting itself so that it doesn't have as much white space in it. It's all very ominous. He also removes Egyptian obelisks from here. I have some suppositions about why he did it, but there, there is no log about why engravers changed and what it is they changed. They were allowed to take artistic license for this. Often engravings were commissioned like this one. So wouldn't your first question be, why is your baby so close to the cliff? <laughs> what are you doing, mom? And then well-known poets were asked to render uh, an accompanying poem, Work for Hire, annuals uh, eventually much to the poet's dismay. Now, what, this is Felicia Hemmons. She was one of the best-selling women poets of the Romantic period, the early 19th century in England and America. She supported herself, her mother, and her nine children by herself based on the poetry that she was able to sell. So this is not just a one-off by some woman. This was somebody that was really famous. And she was writing in response to the engraving itself. The poem didn't come first, so she had some inspiration. So what makes the poetry especially powerful in annuals is ultimately the use of a different kind of poetic voice. One, of the, one that focuses on the domestic, but that doesn't celebrate the war hero. And at this time, the England was going through a lot of wars. They had colonial expansion, so there was always some fight they were having somewhere. It's one that points out the failures of the British government and the limitations of on women's rational thought. And more profoundly, especially in the prose, a voice that understands the need for a different version of femininity. Everyone, and let me be very clear, everyone who we study in the literary canon for the Romantic and the Victorian period in both America and in England contributed to literary annuals. There was nobody who got away with not contributing. And some of them were paid very well, and some of them were not paid very well. So if you think that this is just something that's an offshoot, it's something that was as popular as any magazine that there was during the 19th century. The great idea behind the annual is that the form allowed a space for all of these types of alternative and powerful voices. With a large audience almost immediately clamoring for more annuals, London publisher Rudolf Ackerman and his uh, editor Frederick Scherbel, both German immigrants to London, by the way, 
created a second forget-me-not for 1824 and found themselves competing with Friendship's Offering and The Graces. By 1828, 15 English literary annual titles had joined the market, only to vie for an audience against 30 more titles by 1830. In 1831, not to be outdone, the Americans published 13 different literary annual titles. Interestingly, the first American literary annual, the Atlantic Souvenir, published in 1826, also used green glazed paper boards and a slip case with the same image, the very format used by Ackerman for his 1823 Forget-Me-Not. So this is just the first instance of American publishers capitalizing on the popularity of the literary annual. Publishers Carrie and Leah sold this annual to another publisher in 1832, who in turn merged the title with the token for the 1833 volume. And I do have the token up here if you want to look at it. Ironically, as the British annuals lost their foothold in the consumer marketplace, the American titles began to thrive. It wasn't until 1842 that the American annuals equaled the British numbers, though. By 1846, 56 different annual titles had been published in the United States compared to the 16 titles published in, in all of Britain in that same particular year. Of these 16, some early British literary annual titles continued successful production, including the Forget-Me-Not, Fisher's Drawing Room Scrapbook, and The Keepsake. So really inspired by the intercontinental literary forms and created by Ackerman, who was a su successful art publisher, the annual first appeared in London in 1822 and was claimed by a myriad of publishers to represent the best of British ingenuity, even though they were stealing the form from Germany and France and Spain. But they remade it in British likeness, and so that made it better, and that made it automatically British as well. Even though the material form, the printing process, and the editorial methods were really borrowed from the French pocketbooks, the albums, and the emblems, this was proclaimed in every preface that the literary annual, the British literary annual, was the best that anybody could ever produce in literary her heritage. Originally, annuals were to replace the conduct books of the late 18th century, but the editors and publishers' claims don't match that intention and instead include Gothic short stories, radical poetry, and pop culture ephemera. Now, Gothic short stories also came with engravings uh, with women with ankles exposed and heaving bosoms exposed. You're not supposed to do that then. Many other publishers produced annuals that outsold Rudolf Ackerman's Forget-Me-Not, but this inventor, Ackerman, who established the annual as an extremely marketable model, came to represent Englishness, femininity, and popular artistry because he believed in elevating all aspects of printing to the form of art rather than relegating publishing work to craftsmanship. And let me remind you again, Rudolf Ackerman immigrated to England in the early uh, or the late 18th century, so he's bringing everything he knows about publishing from Germany over into England, and so he's importing a lot of his own German friends and literary authors as well. But he fully, he gets fully, um, uh, he becomes a full citizen of England in 1809, so he's completely naturalized and taking on his new country. The annual, although unique uh, to the 19th century in its particular form, developed from a long tradition of the 16th century emblem, a popular form that combined a picture, a motto, and a poetic epigram to illustrate a moral lesson or meditation. Johann Hosler proposes that emblems represent a multimedia experience because the author himself tells us that the work is to be looked at, read, mediated, understood, weighed, sung, and listened to all at the same time in order to get a deep and true understanding of the cryptic meditative messages found in the apparently bizarre engravings with their textual descriptions and accompanying music. Though Dutch and English em emblem books were continually republished throughout the 18th and 19th century, we see claims of this moralizing from the emblems in on some of the British annuals, but more specifically in the American literary annuals. In 1830, W. Pinnock applauded the use of emblematic images, believing that iconography and allegory offered children the best kind of moral education. Similar to these practices with the 16th century emblems, the literary annual repro reproduces the format but divides emblematic elements and process. The motto is included on the title page, like we have here. <laughs> 
and represents the tenor of the entire volume. Illustrations are typically first engraved and then verbally rendered through poetry, but more starkly, this emblem model supposes that all readers are children. So too did 18th century conduct manuals, uh, publishers and editors. But the annuals, the editors and publishers advertise the same purposes without necessarily infantilizing their women readers. This is the difference for the, the annual. Unlike the emblem engraving, the subjects of the literary annual engravings in the next two slides are always in the act of writing it out, never completing the phrase. And you can see she's writing and inscribing forget-me-not onto stone, albeit, but she's still writing it. And the next one is not much better, it's on a tree. At least you can carve a tree. The idea is that the viewer must, or the reader, must see the person performing the supposed labor of writing in order to perceive the sentiment behind engraved sentiment, a sentiment similar to the purpose of literary annuals themselves. They have to be given openly and they have to be engraven with that inscription page, the one that you can erase. <laughs> Initially, the annual was intended to offer instruction in morality and propriety, or it was allowing readers to meditate on the visual and the literary. And like the 16th century emblematum liber, the early annual's pocket-sized delicacy allowed the book to be a portable reference of morality and propriety, as well as an indicator of education, wealth, friendship, and leadership, or so it seemed. Mixing the emblem with the almanac, another form, the three of them that I've got up here for you guys to see, offered an early opportunity to move away from strict moralizing, though, with the literary annuals. The literary almanac is another long-standing form and has, in title at least, the semblance of family commodities for all ages and conditions, poetry and sentiment for young ladies, astrological predictions of political wonder and national woe, set into marvelous proper verse for their grandams, and for the traveling, agricultural, and professional animals of our own sex, men, sure, prognost uh, sure prognostics of foul and fair weather, of terms and returns of full moons and eclipses. Unlike the annuals, almanacs were primarily intended for the lower classes because they contained astrology, which was likened to prediction rather than rational thought. Literary critic Collins concludes that the almanacs served for a year's reading and guidance and ranked next to the Bible in value. That Ackerman is really super smart by adopting almanac styles because every family had a Bible. Each copy acted as a predictor of more than weather. It held a certain promise of future memories, but not all almanacs were the same. The Lady's Diary, published yearly 1704 to 1840, eschewed astrology and prediction for mathematical problems, typically including enigmas, queries, and the answers to the previous year's questions. In the final pages of the three that I own, the 1768, 1821, and 1822 diary, the listed prize winners for many of the enigmas were men. You can take a look back here. It's men's names. Though the intended audience for this particular almanac was women. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to browse them, I ask you to take a look, even at the type and the print, and consider what they had to do in order to put a mathematical proof into this. And there's um, two or three people here who are from technology and computer, and yeah, I expect you to solve those, Tom. In contrast, the other one that's a pocket book up here, Simpson's Gentleman's Almanac and Pocket Journal for 1816, another station, stationer's company publication acts as a reference for its business-minded male readers, not a workbook of mathematical problems, though, as it's indicated on its contents page. With its charts, tables, and diary features, this invited annotation as opposed to the ladies' diary, which afforded no blank space in that almanac. Uh, the men had space for calendaring, 112 ruled pages for memos, appointments, and cash accounts. So we have a gender differentiation in the purpose of these almanacs, and that was intended to be carried over to literary annuals. The British annual tradition begun by Ackerman carved out a niche and format that were unique and separate from those of the almanac and the emblem. Given his goals for the annuals, Ackerman, as a threshold figure between market and aesthetics, created a product for early 19th century readers that represented the highest form of British ingenuity, coupled with taste 
that renowned marker of class boundaries in early 19th century England and somewhat replicated in America. So what you've got here is the, the definition of uh, what is a literary annual as defined by Rudolf Ackerman in different advertisements in the back and, or in the preface of his early literary annuals. So I won't go through these. I'll leave this up here so you guys can take a look at it. But you had to conform to this to be a literary annual. You could be a gift book and a literary annual, but you couldn't be, you, if you were a gift book, you weren't always a literary annual. So there's a, there's a distinction there, and there's a distinction cause of confusion by the Library of Congress and their cataloging. Library of Congress. That, that would be my sixth project in my career, is to go and correct the cataloging for all gift books and literary annuals and differentiate the two. So one of the things that Ackerman was really good about he, he also released everything on November on Almanac Day, the same day that all the stationers' companies released their almanacs. And so it was taken that a literary annual was to be during the holiday season, and you would give it as a gift to somebody else. You weren't necessarily a, giving it to yourself. So this is one of the first literary annuals in 1824, and it's called The Graces. And it recalls this, these very uh, almost simplistic views of the three graces. It's a neoclassical embellishment, and it's adorning a lot of the covers and slip, uh, slip cases. It's charm, beauty, and literature. And this is what women were supposed to strive towards, charm, beauty, and literature. This is the advertisement for the literary annuals. But when you opened it up, you saw all of these other things that didn't necessarily purport to uh, get women to have an idealized femininity about charm, beauty, and literature. The association with pleasure and beauty was problematic for women readers during the early 19th century. Ackerman and various editors would continually defend the genre as tasteful while printing literary materials that were perhaps more scintillating and aligned with the idea that aesthetic taste is rooted in physical sensation. The diminutive size, the duodecimo, and I have one of these slip cases up here, represents a particular form of femininity by being portable in the pocket or the hand, though the size eventually grew to quarto editions without slip cases and instead wrapped in silk covers. So relying on the various debates surrounding aesthetic and literary taste and the turn from rational thought, Ackerman constructed his literary annual business venture around beauty and new forms of femininity. So what do we make of the American version of these, which is we are in the Book Club of California, so I wanted to make sure that we, we jumped across the Atlantic to talk about a few more of these. The first American Literary Annual appeared in 1826 with the publication of several different titles. I've got a few of them up here. The Atlantic Souvenir, the most popular, the Philadelphia Souvenir, Souvenir, and the Wreath. And they remained viable commodities until 1902 when the last annual Book of Beauty was published. In addition, the Americans created a hybrid nationalism in their annual industry, but they were not as self-conscious about their borrowing as the British. In an 1838 preface, uh, the editor of The Token writes, the present volume is therefore enlarged, rising to the quarto size instead of the smaller Dewey Decimo, in an attempt to make the graphic illustrations larger and to, and to match the standards of the London annuals. The American publishers included images not exclusively of pastoral life of proper, or proper ladies like the British ones did, but scenes from the American landscape, inclu including images of the Wild West and Native Americans. These were the images of, of the of United States, of America. This was their version of savagery and colonial conquest within the confines of the U.S. border, in stark contrast to the depiction of savagery and colonialism outside England expressed in many British literary annuals. At the time of the annual's initial popularity, American authors were newly engaged in the burgeoning American Romantic movement that roughly begins as the, as the British Romanticism was giving way to vic the Victorians. So we're talking 1820 to 1864 American Romanticism. Similar to British Romanticism, American Romanticism focused on landscape, but more forcefully explored the horrors at home. And the short story gained prominence, prominence much as it did with the British literary annuals and authors who contributed to the American annuals. So these include Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Washington Irving, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, James Fenimore Cooper, Ralph Waldo uh, Emerson, and many more, including possibly um, Walt Whitman under some pseudonyms, even though they professed they would never contribute to any literary annuals. They were pressed into service by the really good editors. <laughs> 
With the promise of a wider audience, Ackerman and other publishers ventured into partnership with American and European publishers before the French and American penchant for unauthorized reproduction of annuals became prominent. So just very, very quickly to tell you, let's skip the, the part that gives you the, uh, full, the full Monty. Uh, American, what American publishers would do would essentially get a book uh, at one of these, and they one of the British ones, and they would just simply reset all of the type, and then they would tip in a new title page that just said an American publisher's name with a new year on it, and then they would say, voila, this is our American version of this, and so they would completely steal it. There was no Copyright Act, there was no International Copyright Act until 1842, and that's Charles Dickens got involved, William Wordsworth helped write it in, for 1842, and that's when they put a stop to all of this pilfering from the Americans. But it was harder to steal engravings, especially the steel plate engraving. So this is an actual printer's plate. You couldn't reproduce this necessarily from the engraving itself. You actually had to buy the steel plate engravings from somebody, which they often were able to do because the underpaid workers would smuggle them out of the British shops and they would sell them to the American publishers. To great benefit and profit, by the way. So eventually, this got, Ackerman got wind of this, and he decided he was going to make some sort of deal with the American publishers, and he started sending them his stereotyped plates so they would then publish whatever they, what he was already printing up. But they wouldn't tip in a new title page with a new year in it. They just took the year off. So then American literary annuals would be new forever. <laughs> there would be no end date to it. And since there was no calendar, no lunar year, no prognostication. It was literature that could last forever and ever in America, but not necessarily in England. So I want to conclude with a story. Huck Finn, have you guys read Huck Finn? Maybe a while ago, right? So in Huck Finn, did you ever notice that Huck has access to a friendship's offering, a British literary annual? It's on a table right next to the Bible, and it's in this house that he lives in full of people who are incredibly racist. And so there is a statement being made about both the popularity of the literary annual, the Bible, and then the irony of the house that he's living in. So Mark Twain lets Huck Finn fondle a copy of Friendship's Offering, literally displayed on a coffee table alongside the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress. Hymn books and other politely religious, beautifully bound literature piled up perfectly exactly on each corner of the table. Huck notes that the annual is full of beautiful stuff and poetry, but does not read any of the poetry. A commentary on the initial superior quality of the engravings in American literary annuals versus its poetic contents. Published in 1884, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn reflects the social and cultural temperament of the American 1830s, including the time rife with literary annual volumes, both British and American. The British published Friendship's Offering enjoyed success in the U.S., as did the later 1840s American published version of Friendship's Offering. Twain might be referring to either publication in his novel. However, American annuals moved away from the literary miscellany format to include political essays on temperance, anti-slavery, women's rights, and it was only thinly veiled by the beauty of the literary annuals binding. Thank you very much for listening tonight.